Good evening, all. We're glad to have each and every one of you here tonight. Um, I would say before I begin, great job, James. Very good job tonight with that lesson. Um, definitely something for each of us to consider. The last time I was given the reins for the Wednesday night Bible class, we, uh, we studied an introduction to the book of Daniel. I would like to continue that study tonight. Um, a few introductory remarks and then actually going into some of the text. So if you would be following along in the book of Daniel, we'll be spending probably the next 30 minutes dealing with that. Um, as per normal way of doing things, we'll open it up to questions We'll try to shoot for 10 or 15 minutes uh, before the end of the, before 8.30, if you do have questions or comments. Can't promise I'll be able to answer them, but I'll at least give a, an I don't know or a, a book chapter verse. At any rate, the book of Daniel, uh, we consider the actual meaning of Daniel. Uh, as a word, Daniel means God or Jehovah is my judge. Uh, this presents a key theme for the book. That is, God will judge all nations of men. And we see this ultimately carried out throughout the chapters. Uh, verse 2 of Daniel chapter 1 shows us uh, a second theme is that God is in control. I think both of these themes are key uh, points of view that everyone must have especially we as christians we must understand that god is in control and should give us comfort uh, but also keeping in mind that god will judge all of mankind nation by nation and once this life in the flesh is over individual by individual But we do see again from verse 2 that God does use other nations to uh, punish unfaithful Israel. Uh, now, this also shows the long suffering and love of God. How do we say that? Well, keep in mind how long Israel was worshiping God under the law of Moses, the period of time which they were expected to be faithful to him. And Periods of time would come where they would be unfaithful. They would be persecuted and eventually punished by other nations. And then that would wake them up, if you will, and they would become more faithful to God. And they had these different cyclical ways of doing things. And eventually God's long suffering ended. And his justice and wrath kicked in, if you want to look at it that way. And ultimately, Israel would be punished for its wrongdoing. Uh, even though as a nation, Israel was unfaithful, we must realize that there were still individuals who remained obedient to God. And they were still taken care of by God. Uh, again, considering his long suffering, even throughout the punishment, you can look at it as, at least my way of viewing things, a better late than never opportunity at repentance. They, were, they had prophets sent to them where they were expected to repent because God's wrath was upon them. God's wrath eventually came upon them. And until their death, they had the opportunity to repent. Now, that would not end the circumstances which they were under but they still had the opportunity to repent before Jehovah God. Uh, the other thing I think many often overlook, maybe not realize, is while Israel was worshiping God under the law of Moses, the other nations were still worshiping God under the law of patriarchy. And they were then still expected to be faithful to God in that regard. And when a country or a nation, rather, was unfaithful to God, they were punished for it. We see this as a function of the nation of Israel 
They were God's wrath in, in flesh form. They were to be the scourge of unfaithful nations. But whenever they became un unfaithful themselves, God would ultimately use another nation to punish Israel. And throughout these different workings and punishments, we can see God actually using the leaders of these nations, using the nations themselves. We can see this in Isaiah chapter 10, verses 23 through 27. Isaiah chapter 13, verse 17, as well as Isaiah chapter 42, verse 13. In those passages, it talks about God stirring up different leaders. Now, we, we see, though, that, again, something I think we overlook. I know I'm guilty of it. I have been guilty of it. And it's easy to do is we think oftentimes that the events of the Bible occur in the same order that the books are placed. We, we kind of assume that the books are actually in chronological order. But to help put some things in perspective, Daniel was, was working as a prophet during roughly the same time frame as Jeremiah and Ezekiel. Jeremiah was doing his work in, in Jerusalem both before and during the Babylonian captivity in roughly 626 to 528 B.C. Ezekiel doing his work in Babylon, but among the captives, a time frame being 592 roughly to 570 B.C., and then Daniel working within the city or the capital city of Babylon in roughly 605 to 586 BC. So these three, these three men were working in different aspects, but they all did it roughly about the same time. But you won't get that if you if you consider the books being in chronological order. But you got to have the books in some order in order to have things complete and to have order to a book but it's an easy easy trap to fall into but we must realize that that's not always the case a good example of that would be first and second kings first and second samuel first and second chronicles well this that brings us to our text uh, daniel chapter one verse one it there says in the third year of the reign of jehoiakim king of judah came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem, and besieged it. Now, if you're not familiar with history, secular history, uh, I'd like to spend quite a bit of time showing some history of these verses, um, relating to current events, the goings-on of the different nations round about Babylon and even Israel. But King Nebuchadnezzar, was the son of Nabopolassar. And he was considered the first king, or Nab Nabopolassar, that is, the first king of the Chaldean dynasty. A little bit of background regarding Nabopolassar. In 626 BC, he would revolt against Assyria. See, Assyria had basically control over Babylon as well as other nations, but King Nabopolassar would revolt against Assyria and would actually declare himself to be king of Babylon. Um, now, in order to accomplish this victory, Nabopolassar actually made an alliance with Syaxerxes, or Syaxeres, rather, who was king of the Medes at the time. And eventually, in 614 BC, the forces of Mede and Babylon laid siege to the Assyrian capital city of Nineveh. After about two years, Nineveh still remained strong. It remained standing. Uh, the only thing that really defeated it, or I guess the ultimate cause of it being defeated, was the flooding of the Tigris River. Uh, it, it flooded through one of the channels, I forget which one, 
uh, but this flood, this great flood of water eventually damaged a portion of the wall and uh, the Babylonian Median uh, forces capitalized on that and they, they uh, broke the ramparts and pursued in within the city and then proceeded to take the city. Uh, as with many armies, there is still a portion of the Assyrian army um, in different areas. One, one of those places would be Haran. Uh, this is Abraham's home city. And eventually in 610 BC, Haran also fell by the hand of Babylon and the Medes. Another portion of the Assyrian army made its final stand at uh, Carchemish in roughly 609 BC. And by this time, Nabopolassar, king of Babylon, was quite sick. And as a result, he sends his son, Nebuchadnezzar, secular history would call him Nebuchadnezzar II. Uh, basically, he would send his son, Nebuchadnezzar, to put down the uprising, the uh, attempted result in Carchemish. Um, this event is referenced in uh, 2 Kings chapter 23, verses 28 through 30, as well as 2 Chronicles chapter 35, verse 20. And what happened there is uh, the, the king of Egypt, Pharaoh Necho, also went to participate in this fight as well as King Josiah. This actually would be his final battle. This is the one he died in. Again, uh, those passages, 2 Kings chapter 23, or excuse me, yeah, chapter 23, verses 28 through 30, 2 Chronicles chapter 35, verse 20. You can read about those events there. Well, roughly five years later, Nebuchadnezzar would lead the armies of Babylon into Jerusalem. And in doing so, he ended any chance of the Assyrians uprising or gaining any kind of control. Keeping in mind that Assyria had taken uh, the northern kingdom captive. But Nebuchadnezzar squashed, if you will, the Assyrians. And this was basically his uh, final method, final way of ending any Assyrian rule by attempting to uh, besiege Jerusalem. And we see that he was successful. Uh, during this encampment, we do note that uh, Nabopolassar died. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar would not be able to find this out immediately. He'd find it out um, after returning. But uh, because of Nabopolassar's death, this would promote King Nebuch or Nebuchadnezzar to king shortly thereafter. Thus, he is referenced as being Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Now, it's basically looking back in time, thus giving him the title. But at the time he besieged Jerusalem, he was not actually king. <clears throat> Verse 2, Daniel 1, says, And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. Now this King Jehoiakim, he is known in other passages as Eliakim, was the oldest son of King Josiah, as we just mentioned earlier, who died in the battle there of Carchemish. Um, and because of Josiah's death, there was quite a bit of tumult as far as who would ultimately uh, take the throne. But eventually Jehoiakim did actually replace his father as king. <clears throat> as we read, the invasion of Babylon occurred in the third year of Jehoiakim's reign as king. Uh, from 2 Kings chapter 24, verse 1, we can see that he served King Nebuchadnezzar for three years and eventually would revolt against him. After which King Nebuchadnezzar bound him and took him back to Babylon. Uh, 
Second Chronicles chapter 36, verses 5 and 6. So not only is Jehoiakim one of the evil kings of Judah, but he's also unruly. He revolted against Babylon, uh, against King Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, very, very poor move on his part. Now, evidently, King Jehoiakim was a very good beggar because he was allowed to keep his position. We see this. Uh, it's written that he was able to still rule in Jerusalem for a total of 11 years. Uh, six of the, those years would have already been taken up previously, as we mentioned. Uh, three years without being captive, three years under Nebuchadnezzar's rule, but then five years after that, uh, after he, I guess if you could say, begged for his position. But either way, Nebuchadnezzar granted that. He allowed him to function, I would say, as a figurehead. <clears throat> now, also from verse 2 of Daniel 1, we see that King Nebuchadnezzar was a, was a very religious man. Uh, during the, the Spanish conquests, they had a saying of what they were after, God, gold, and glory. And uh, as good Catholics typically do things, they, they, hid behind, <clears throat> excuse me, they hid behind doing things in God's name, ultimately for the good of themselves or maybe that of their ruler. That's kind of the idea that is presented here with King Nebuchadnezzar. He is a religious man, though he is worshiping a false god. Uh, says he carried the, the vessels from the temple of God or the house of God back into Shinar, which was the house of his god. We, we find that, well, we know that Babylon had a quite a, lengthy pantheon of gods but uh nebuchadnezzar worshiped marduk in particular uh, he was one of many gods of babylon uh, marduk although was the god of justice compassion healing regeneration magic fairness and in some instances also the god of storms and agriculture so he was a God of many things, God of many talents. Uh, due to his dedication to Marduk, we see that ne King Nebuchadnezzar took these temple vessels back with him to, to place in the house of Marduk back in Babylon. Now, verse 3 says, And the king, that is Nebuchadnezzar, spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes. It's interesting to note that this is actually a fulfillment of the prophecy found in 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 12. Uh, you'll find in this account where a prideful Hezekiah showed uh, Baladin's messengers all that was in his house. And as a result, the prophet Isaiah foretold of a time when Hezekiah's sons would eventually be taken into captivity by Babylon and ultimately forced to become eunuchs. Uh, <clears throat> again, that's 2 Kings chapter 20, but found also in verse 17 and 18, as well as Isaiah chapter 39, verses 1 through 7. Verse 4 says, children in whom was no blemish. So we're giving qualifications for the, the children that the king demanded. Children in whom was no blemish, but well-favored, skillful in all wisdom and cunning, <clears throat> in knowledge and understanding science, such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. Now, that's quite a list of qualifications, especially for young people. Um, but we would note some of the terms being here used. 
um, not having any blemish would include not having any kind of physical imperfection. The well-favored, this would be reference to uh, them being good-looking, handsome if they're, if they're boys, pure, uh, pretty or beautiful if they're girls. Uh, being skillful in all wisdom, would indicating that uh, these youths would be intelligent and would have high mental capacity for comprehension. Uh, being endued with knowledge, obviously being possessing knowledge, uh, they, they know different things. They're, they're not your average Joe, as you might say. Uh, they must understand science, that is, having the keen perception and also the ability to weigh and balance knowledge and understanding. They're able to reason properly based on the, the different things that they can learn and know empirically. Uh, and such as had the ability to stand in the king's palace. It's not necessarily whether you can stand or sit down, but keeping in mind that the caliber people that were in the king's palace, these were uh, young adults, I guess older children, if you want to look at that. Either way, these are youths, but they have to be able to intellectually stand before the king and be able to hold their own. They were going to have responsibilities put on them and they would have to be able to um, take those responsibilities and perform the tasks that they've been given. And they had to be able to learn the different things that they would be taught. Um, they had to have a teachable attitude, a teachable disposition. Obviously, not, not all children are that way, especially teenagers. So these are, these are young people that had the ability to accept change, accept instruction, and ultimately be able to learn the language of the Chaldeans. <clears throat> now, obviously, only the finest youths of Judah were to be chosen. Not everybody would be up to this task. Now, these youths would eventually be made eunuchs in a strange land. Now, this would be quite a painful and humiliating process for any male, but especially for those ages 14 to 19. Uh, now, along with this, especially as, as Jews, this would come with a consequence. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 1, these boys would no longer be able to be a part of Jehovah's assembly. Now, this would be something that's out of their control, but something that they must be subject to. Uh, verse 5 here says, and the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank so nourishing them three years that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. King Nebuchadnezzar wanted these youths to be able to have the best diet available. Thus he gave them food, excuse me, food from his table. This would provide an advantage for their upcoming training. Now this would include uh, the delicacies that would be only found at the king's table. <clears throat> uh, verses six and seven says, Now among these were of the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names, for he gave unto Daniel the name of Belteshazzar to Hananiah of Shadrach, to Mishael of Meshach, and to Azariah of Abednego. Now, we don't know exactly how many youths were taken captive for this purpose. Uh, we certainly don't know their country of origin. Either way, none of them excelled over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. 
Now, I would like to note before we close the different meanings of these boys' names. As we said, Daniel's name means Yahweh or God is my judge. Now, as we just read, his name would be changed to Belteshazzar, which is uh, means in or to the Babylon people, Bel, protect the king. Now, Bel is a reference to Marduk. So we see more of their the Babylonian religion coming out in these names. And all this would be done, of course, to help assimilate these boys into Babylonian culture. Hananiah means Yahweh is gracious. His name was changed to Shadrach, which means inspired or command of Aku. Now, Aku is the Babylonian moon god. Mishael, Hebrew name means who is what God is, was changed to Meshach, which means one belonging to Aku. And then we have Azariah, which means Yahweh has helped. And his name was changed to Abednego, which means servant of Nego. Now, I couldn't really find much information on this Nego, but it, it was some god of Babylon that was associated with light. So again, these boys, they had their Hebrew names, obviously all pertaining to God, Jehovah. And in order to fully assimilate into Babylonian captivity, they were stripped of their names and given Babylonian names to, I would say, to help help erase and help them make the transition. I think we'll go ahead and stop there if there's anybody with questions or comments.